We're going to go ahead and get started here with the law and policy panel, um, the last one of the day. Um, and we have uh, three terrific panelists. And so I guess we'll just go in order here, Lisa Hajar, um, and then uh, followed by Richard Leo, and finally, Karen Shepley. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. Well, it's nice to be at a conference on torture. Um, I, uh, just to give a brief introduction to the topic of my um, paper, um, my paper's titled Lawfare, Viva La Litigation, and I'm sure it'll come, become clear quite soon what it's about. It's a little, the issue of lawfare um, and what I'll be talking about is just a little patch on the large, you know, torture terrain, but this patch has some deep roots. So I'm going to assume a lot of things that I won't actually uh, go into. Um, so basically, debating what is legal in the interrogation and detention of war on terror prisoners is an American pastime, as this uh, conference reveals. Torture isn't legal, of course, which is why President Bush continues to press the official soundbite that, what, that we don't torture. And plenty of people are willing to accept the president on his word by choosing to ignore abundant evidence to the contrary. Other administration officials have gone beyond short declarative sentences to explain that if we do it, it's not torture. The pattern is to deny allegations when they surface, to justify what can't be denied by stoking public fears, to fire whistleblowers and retire uniformed critics, to invoke state secrets privileges to impede investigations and dismiss lawsuits, to press for new legislation to immunize those responsible for torture, and to portray domestic critics of American torture as unpatriotic or even as terrorist sympathizers whose criticisms endanger the national interest. The highest ranking torture denier advocate is, of course, Vice President Cheney. He appeals, in both senses of the word, to people who accept that the interrogation of enemy prisoners is a sovereign prerogative and that coercive and enhanced tactics are, at worst, a lesser evil <coughs> to terrorism and, at best, an effective means of getting good information. In a February 7th speech to the Conservative Political Action Conference, Cheney said, and I quote, the procedures of the CIA program are designed to be safe, and they are in full compliance with the nation's laws and treaty obligations. They've been carefully reviewed by the Department of Justice and very carefully monitored. The program is run by highly trained professionals who understand their obligations under the law, and the program has uncovered a wealth of information that has foiled attacks against the United States. The information has saved thousands of lives. Applause. There's one element of, of truth to Vice President Cheney's claim. The CIA program has been reviewed by the Department of Justice, and that's a major point of contention in the unending debate about torture. Now, revelations about torture and the legal rationale supporting them have galvanized people across the political spectrum and the civilian military divide to articulate their commitment to the absolute prohibition of torture, not to mention its inefficacy and the damaging effects it's had on the nation's institutions and reputation. However, this bipartisan anti-torture constituency yields to myriad disagreements over whether what we do is legal and how it is to be decided. Since what we do has the imprimatur of the White House and the D Department of Justice, less so the Pentagon since Rumsfeld's departure, um, criticisms are in essence criticisms of what is official. Some legal, pra some legal practitioners and intellectuals and activists have no compunction about criticizing any government, including their own, that authorizes tactics that constitute torture and abuse. Others, and especially active and retired members of the military, who have no predisposition or prior history of criticizing their government about national security-related matters, are in some cases discomfited that their principled opposition allies them with people with long records of criticizing the U.S. government. And needless to say, American party politics and allegiances also play a, discomfort in some, a role in the discomfort in some critics. To give one example, in July 2005, when Republican Senator and um, um, and JAG reservist Lindsey Graham read into the congressional record 60 classified memos by top JAG Corps lawyers that were harshly critical of the Pentagon's acceptance of your Office of Legal Counsel's reasoning. Um, he said, these JAGs, quote, are not from the ACLU. These are not from people who are soft on terrorism, who want to coddle foreign terrorists. Graham's reading of these memos into the record was itself a criticism of what is official. Um, but his slur against the ACLU ignored that those JAGs and the ACLU are on the same side if the dividing line is between those who accept the legality of what is official and those who don't. 
Now, how does the Bush administration and its supporters of interrogation policies characterize criticisms and challenges? Lawfare. Although lawfare has a negative connotation, in the current context, litigation has become the means of last resort to try to restore the rule of law. And that's essentially what I'll be focusing on. So first I want to start with the, the multiple meanings of law, lawfare. On March 18, 2003, Lawfare, the Latest in Asymmetries, was the title of the National Security Roundtable convened at the Council on Foreign Relations to discuss, quote, the increased use of legal tools to combat American military might. The roundtable coincided with the start of the U.S.-led war against Iraq, but the discussion, as described in the summary posted online, included concerns about the then-year-old International Criminal Court and the, quote, widening gap between the legal culture in the United States and Europe. This widening gap refers implicitly to Europeans' increasing willingness to enforce international criminal law for gross violations by passing or using universal jurisdiction laws. The 1999 Pinochet precedent in particular demonstrated that a solid ally like Britain would not succumb to a sovereign immunity argument in connection with torture, even for a former head of state. The participants in the, um, in the council roundtable are not named, but one of them was obviously Major General Charles Dunlap, because the definitions of lawfare offered in the summary are identical to those he presented in a paper at Harvard in November 2001, and again in a speech he gave um, in November 2007 at an American Bar Association conference. Dunlap has consistently defined lawfare as, quote, a strategy of using or misusing law as a substitute for traditional military means to achieve military objectives. In the 2003 um, Council Roundtable Summary, one example of lawfare was the filing of human rights suits by Colombian peasants against military figures, which was compared to a decapitation strike because it might remove a military commander from active duty to contend with the suit. Another example, which appears in both the 2003 and 2007 cases, was the way enemies might manipulate American respect for the laws of armed combat by deliberately placing combatants among civilians, quote, to goad American forces into violations, which are then used against the United States in the court of world opinion. Now, the Colombian peasant example suggests that lawfare can mean any use of law that does not emanate from the military itself and may affect military members or operations. The human shields example conflates lawfare with the existence of the laws of war. In 2007, Dunlap diversified his examples to illustrate the potential for good lawfare, citing General David Petraeus' establishment of a rule of law complex in Baghdad. Dunlap's definition, which his examples illustrate, is simultaneously too narrow in its military-centeredness and too broad in its conception of the law to be analytically coherent. For him, anything that involves or affects both the military and the law is a manifestation of lawfare. Its goodness or badness, as he puts it, is like a weapon that depends on who is wielding it, how they do so, and why. Dunlap's 2007 address is titled Lawfare Today because he addresses the ways in which the concept has been used by right-wing officials, and I would say I, I use the term right-wing, I mean radical right-wing, and the term conservative would be inappropriate to describe these people, but right-wing officials and commentators to condemn critics of the Bush administration, including, and this, what, this is what particularly agitates Dunlap, uniformed and retired members of the military who have opposed the authorization and reliance on torture in the war on terror. For right-wingers, lawfare means any litigation or legal reasoning that is intended to restrict executive branch discretion or challenge the administration's prisoner policies. For them, there is no good lawfare. And the ex example par excellence, of course, is the Pentagon's 2005 national defense strategy conflating, quote, international processes, judicial fora, and terrorism. While Dunlap's 2007 address retains his military centeredness, he applauds the military civilian alliances that have built up since 2003 to work against torture and abuse. He writes, quote, concern by publics, NGOs, academics, legislatures, and the courts about the behavior of militaries is more than a mere public relations problem. It is a legitimate and serious activity totally consistent with adherence to the rule of law, democratic values, and for that matter, lawfare. The use of the courts is something I advocate as a vitally important lawfare measure. 
Dunlap goes to length to praise the role that some JAGs have playing in criticizing the program and bringing cases that challenge the legality of the military commissions, among other things. And he berates the JAGs' right-wing critics. He directs his most harsh comments to, jo to John Yu, who, in a co-authored UCLA Law Review article, blames military lawyers for a, quote, breakdown in civil military relations. Dunlap says, and I quote, I beg to differ. JAG opposition to harsh physical interrogation techniques was a reflection of an analysis of the fundamental principles of human decency that underpin law in this country, not to mention around the globe. Philip Carter, a lawyer who has served in the military, although not as a military lawyer, endorses Dunlap's military-centered definition and agrees that lawfare can be a good thing. For example, he wrote an amicus brief opposing the government for Hamdan v. Rumsfeld. In a, Slate to, um, in a 2005 article in Slate, Carter writes, and I quote, truth be told, we have every reason to embrace lawfare, for it is vastly preferable to the bloody, expensive, and destructive forms of warfare that ravaged the world in the 20th century. First, lawfare has the obvious advantage of being safer than conventional warfare. I would far prefer to have motions and discovery requests fired at me than incoming mortar or rocket-propelled grenade fire. Second, our nation has developed safeguards to protect against the malicious use of its court processes. In short, our legal system today is far more sophisticated than the simplistic lawfare tactics of our enemies, and we should have more faith in its ability to protect us. Now, Carter's phrasing in that article illustrates the problem with, you know, sort of when military members defend lawfare. Who are they and who are us? Um, Carter's us are foremost the military and more inclusively the nation, and they are the enemy. In a blog entry on his, uh, his blog, Intel Dump, written the following month, Carter recognizes the problem, that they going to court against the government include members of the military and thus are us. In this piece, he uses they and us interchangeably, and he writes, and I quote, those litigating the cases of Guantanamo detainees at this moment are not doing so in order to disrupt U.S. military operations. We are arguing these cases in order to uphold the U.S. Constitution and to make our government conform to those ideals which we as a nation have consecrated ourselves to. <coughs> The retired generals and admirals who filed a brief in Hamdan v. Rumsfeld did not do so because they wanted to aid and abet America's enemies. Quite the contrary. They filed their brief because they wanted to help America retain the moral, political, and legal high ground in the war on terrorism because they recognize that doing so is essential for strategic victory. We are not engaged in this fight because we hate America or want to help America's enemies prevail. We are engaging this issue in the courts because we care deeply about America and because we want this country to live up to its highest ideals, even or especially when at war. Now, Dunlap, Carter, and others who defend lawfare yield definitional ground to the right-wing emphasis on litigation. However, just now I would say as a non-lawyer, there's, there's a problem with the whole lawyerly discourse on litigation in terms of the way use of the courts is discussed. Prisoners who have the status as enemies are in no position to do much of anything, let alone initiate legal action. People who are in a position to actually use the courts are not enemies. They're U.S. lawyers, both civilian and military, who have brought cases addressing the treatment of enemies or innocent victims who are mistakenly treated like enemies, like Maher Arar and Khalid al-Masri. Now, right-wing critics of lawfare like you, David Rivkin, <laughs> Lee Casey, and others have a very clear sense of who we and they are. Scott Horton is correct in characterizing them as lawfare theorists because their friend-enemy distinction is more complex than it might appear at first blush, and it rests on a combination of legal reasoning and partisan politics. First and foremost is the conflation of the president with the nation, which lends itself to assertions that criticisms and challenges to executive branch policies are anti-American and provide aid and comfort to the enemy. It's a short, slippery slope to interpreting such behavior as tantamount to terrorism. Second is the institutional subordination of the military, as well as Congress and the courts, to the uni unitary executive in times of war. Hence, efforts by members of the military to exercise institutional semi-autonomy, for example, using military law expertise to criticize interrogation and detention policies that reject the applicability of the Geneva Conventions, is condemned as lawfare and uniform. <clears throat> However, the good military, compliant and agreeable, is protected from the menace of lawfare by the shielding grace of the commander-in-chief's executive discretion. 
Third is the paradoxically simultaneous loathing of the courts and Congress as nemeses of the unitary executive, while favoring partisan litmus tests and cross-institutional solidarities to stack both with like-minded souls who accept that anything we do is legal because we are us, or better, help remake and reinterpret the law to legalize anything we, the royal we, that is, do. These lawfare theorists argue that our enemies are using it against us. Since the it is litigation, their us and them dichotomy literally makes no sense because it reflects no ideologically or empirically unified groups of people, as Dunlap, Carter, and others have correctly pointed out. To be fair, some of them do have a very clear us in mind, which is literally them. One literal we are us is John Yu, who, success, who suggests that the civil suit brought against him by Jose Padilla menaces not just him personally, but all Americans. In the first of his Padilla suit op-eds titled, Terrorist Suspects Are Waging Lawfare on US, on the US, or on us, Yu writes, the 9-11 attacks on our nation's capital and financial center and the loss of 3,000 American lives placed the United States at war with Al-Qaeda, a fact that Padilla's lawyers do not accept. You also claims that the suit, and lawfare more generally, is, an, is undemocratic because it ignores the fact that the people gave George Bush the presidency, and thus any policies he has authorized are by extension an expression of the people's will. This people's will thesis extends to cover you, a political appointee elected by no one. Now, the re I want to come to the question of uh, the, the issue of litigation. The, the, tor the anti-torture camp is so diverse because People with so many different backgrounds and outlooks concur that torture is absolutely prohibited. And the American courts have become sites of struggle over what is legal because the Bush administration has authorized po policies that constitute torture and cruel treatment and refuse to change course. And Congress has failed to act effectively to resolve the gap between what we do and what is legal. If anything, developments over the last few years, including the Military Commissions Act, the shakeups and showdowns at Guantanamo, and the waterboarding debate have made the question of what is legal a bigger mess than ever. This mess resonates within the anti-torture camp. As I would interpret the fault lines, some opine about what is legal in distinctively nationalistic ways, by which I mean that their center of analytical and interpretive gravity is American laws and institutions, to which the clarity of the prohibition against torture is muddied by the institutional roles of the authors of post-9-11 interrogation policies. Others, often people whose expertise on torture and or wartime <laughs> interrogation and detention of prisoners predates 9-11, tend to opine about what is legal in more international nationalistic ways by characterizing torture as an international crime and emphasizing the significance of international laws. To give one example, and I'm drawing on this from the torture list, so just very briefly to explain what the torture list is, it's a by invitation um, torture chat space. Kim Shepley uh, organizes all torture all the time. Um, and uh, it's, I mean, it's absolutely fascinating. It includes members of the military, academics, legal practitioners, human rights activists. Um, and so every minute detail about torture is debated. Um, so anyway, to give an example from the torture list, there's been a vigorous and serious debate about everything, but about whether John Yu is legally culpable or in some way culpable for torture. So just to give an example of the uh, disputes about the debate, some argue that he can't be liable because of the immunity that officials enjoy while performing their jobs. This is often combined with the it's not illegal to be stupid argument. Some people argue that the function of the OLC, regardless of the stupidity or error of opinions from lawyers, is the source of legal reasoning. Others argue that legal opinions that advise the client, in this case the government, to disregard or break the law, which is what the, the torture memos and the war council sessions did, can't be legal. The no immunity for lawyers who break the law argument is backed up by the example of the allied prosecution of German jurists at Nuremberg. This then raises related debates over what is possible and what is right, wherein some argue that the relevance of the Nuremberg example does not apply here because there is no willingness by prosecutors and courts to entertain such arguments vis-a-vis -vis American officials in American courts. Hence, for the more pragmatic, nationalist-minded interlocutors, the, if the courts won't do it, it's wrong-headedly utopian and jurisprudentially unfounded to even advocate some, such litigation. Well, I will just conclude with a few, uh, I come in on the international camp, and I'll conclude with offering a few views about why lawfare is necessary and why the concept and its context must be internationalized. 
Torture is, among other things, a legal problem. It's a crime. Its prohibition is enshrined in many laws, some of which attach universal jurisdiction. And the disputed interpretations about whether and which um, US practices constitute torture or cruel treatment have been so muddied by the passage of laws by our own democratic institutions that the courts are the only place left to sort out the competing claims. I certainly acknowledge that the political effects of American exceptionalism and legal parochialism, including the Military Commission Act's prohibition of U.S. courts to even reference international or foreign laws and court decisions, has significant constraints on the domestic pursuit of justice. However, the necessity and legitimacy of litigation cannot be determined by the actual or likely outcome of cases. Rather, the very act of going to court serves two important functions. It demonstrates a commitment to the norms and the laws that torture is always and everywhere illegal. And it creates a record for the future so that someday when this era is assessed by historians, it will be known and understood that there were people willing to devote themselves, sometimes at the risk of their reputations and careers, to challenge torture and abuse. In the 1990s, when many authoritarian, military, and racist regimes around the world were being replaced by post-conflict democracies, including South Africa, as Albie Sachs so poignantly discussed yesterday, societies had to grapple with the question of whether torturers and those who abetted torture should be punished or amnesty. In many countries at that time, punishment was either precluded by concerns that prosecution would have a destabilizing effect in those precarious moments, or societies chose to pursue alternatives to legal justice, such as truth commissions. At that time, Jose Zalaquet, a Chilean human rights activist and former victim of the Pinochet regime, and Ari Nair, who was, uh, you know, had been originally with the ACLU, was um, back then with human, the director of Human Rights Watch, now with the Open Society. The two of them debated the question. I mean, they debated over and over again. So what I'm describing appears in many um, sources. Zalaket argued that society should decide, not just the victims of torture. And let's say that he's very, he himself had been tortured, was very empathetic to victims of torture. Um, but he said that if there was a democratic desire, by which he meant a majoritarian desire, to amnesty violators, that this was a legitimate outcome. Nair responded that justice is not democratic. For him, the universality of laws and norms meant that the whole world, not just the national state and society, has a stake in the prevention and punishment of torture and other gross crimes. I would argue, using the example of Pinochet, that justice can be democratic. Of course, he had given himself immunity for his torturous and murderous legacy, and then he went to England. When he was arrested in London, people who initially protested were not just those who supported the former dictator, but some of his Chilean victims who chafed at the idea that um, foreigners, Europeans no less, might usurp Chilean sovereignty by prosecuting the country's past leader abroad. However, after Pinochet was found legally liable for torture um, and, but returned home for health reasons, his aura had been shattered, and this enabled a new chapter in Chilean democratic justice, revising the country's laws and pursuing those responsible for torturing courts. Similar patterns have occurred across Latin America every year, bringing new cases against formerly immunized torturers. It was the use of universal jurisdiction in the Pinochet case that contributed to the strengthening of democracy in Chile, and this spread. The origins of the doctrine of universal jurisdiction trace back to international efforts to outlaw piracy and the slave trade. It was built on the idea that people responsible for such practices are enemies of all mankind. Torture attaches universal jurisdiction, as does terrorism, and its practitioners and abettors are contemporary enemies of all mankind. Domestic jurisdiction and the socio-political conditions that enable or prevent a pra the practice of torture in any given country are important considerations, but torture affects the world. And when the most important state in the world tortures, and when national leaders, domestic courts, and legislators enable torture and impunity, it affects the world. It's important, I think, for more people to understand and appreciate universal jurisdiction as an expression of respect for the law, and to integrate that understanding in their own fights against torture here in the US. Because every fight against torture anywhere in the world is a sign of faith and respect for the law, and it's the good fight of our age. Questions for Lisa? Well, I, I have one. Um, <laughs> a lot of the kind of discomfort or, or I guess opposition to, to lawfare seems to maybe have parallels. And I was just curious if, if 
you had uh, looked into this or if there might be something here, to um, some of the reactions in uh, when criminal when criminal defendants were given sort of additional protections um, through uh, the, in, in sort of the era of giving sort of increasing protections. There was sort of this idea that the bad guys are getting away, that the police are getting hung up on technicalities, and this idea that, um, that somehow the uh, the, the overarching goals that were so important for the police to achieve, they're being hamstrung in some way that was, it was really <coughs> problematic. And I, I wonder if anything, if there's anything sort of to be, to be learned from that parallel at all, or if you, or if you think mm -hmm. that, that parallel works uh, at any level. Uh, yes, I think absolutely. These, the, the history, so the socio-political history of views about law are very much re responsive to, you know, changes in the country and the, um, you know, in a sense, the age of neoconservatism coming in the late 60s, early 70s as a kind of, you know, blowback from the great society era and one in which sort of the war on crime gets developed was something that on the one hand there was um, a very powerful push to get tougher on crime, which has subsequently turned into things. And, you know, um, so we've seen a very mixed record. While the kind of criminal um, defendant rights that were elaborated in particular in the 1960s were seen as part of the problem in terms of all that. So you, you get in a sense, um, you know, uh, all kinds of discourses like hostility towards judicial activism and notions that litigation is undemocratic and, uh, and so on, especially around these kinds of questions. So these all, I think, play at the very basic level of those who are, you know, critics of lawfare, the sort of right-wing critics because there's, a, there's an argument about uh, that the courts should serve a certain kind of function where you can, easily ch you can more easily channel people who are determined by society to be criminals into it without these excesses of rights, um, but that you know, too much lawyering is a problem, et cetera. Um, but on the other hand, you know, what, what I find particularly paradoxical, and this is also something that I've written about elsewhere, I mean, I actually believe that one of the problems, so, so anyway, I, you know, I, I do believe that all of these things, the notion of, of the over-lawyered, you know, as, as uh, Jack Goldsmith have even said, the problem wasn't not enough law with 9-11, it was like the over-lawyering, and so the lawfare um, critics are certainly regarding all of this, you know, as, as a, perhaps a parallel manifestation. However, one of the arguments that I, you know, have made elsewhere is that, you know, the notion that, you know, if, if it's not a problem and people have no um, compunction about, you know, thinking it's legitimate to prosecute and send carjackers to prison, like what, I mean, torture is at least as bad a crime as carjacking. And so I've, you know, made the case that we should try, I mean, people who are anti-torture might want to think about um, embracing the kind of tough on crime rhetoric and just simply expanding it in that way. Because I don't think that, for similar reasons I raised in a question earlier in the day, I don't think that um, the fight against torture gets much traction in this country for many reasons, but especially if you focus on victims. I mean, one really needs to focus on the crime and then you know, uphold the applicability of the law. So I, that's my suggestion. Uh, Davis's actions and the, you know, the Hicks case, et cetera, with you know, Swift's activities and so on. Yeah, I, I'm wondering if um, if you haven't bought the Bush administration's definition of lawfare to uncritically. I can't believe I'm saying this about you, Lisa, yeah. but um, but I'm, but it seems to me that one of the really interesting things about the way the war on terror has been fought and the way the torture issues has been handled is how heavily uh, lawyered it has been from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Right? That how many lawyers have been involved in this between Addington and you and the OLC, and that all of this was treated from the beginning as a question of legality, and this has really, and that a lot of the Bush administration's efforts have been devoted to fuzzing the legality, right, but in the in legal terms, and dealing with immunities, and really, I mean, so, so what strikes me as being sort of interesting about lawfare is that in many ways what they've done is they projected onto their opponents what they're doing to themselves, right, which is interpreting every question as a matter of personal immunity, of personal liability for each actor in government, which I'm not sure is the way anyone would have thought of it before they went to such great lengths to immunize themselves from it, right? Yeah. Um, and so there's this curious kind of weird legalization of it coming from the Bush administration, which has generated some of the legalism of the pushback. Right. Oh, um, no, that's in fact, that's why I actually think that the courts um, are, are, have become this, 
you know, site for trying to deal with the kind yeah, yeah. of legalizing what is official. One of the questions, though, that I you maybe would stress on this one, I wonder if, you know, you agree, we can talk now or later, is the, um, you know, it, it is the kind of, your know, torture is an international crime. And so the kind of national arguments that have been built up, and even the kind of critics of torture who sort of believe that the world of torture and the law begins in Portland, Maine, and ends in Honolulu, it's like, you know, that there's some sense that no matter what happens in this country, including the winning or losing of cases, you know, the legal record, I mean, the rest of the world can judge, including possibly, you know, down the line, universal jurisdiction type cases. It doesn't matter to a German what John, you, you know, how esteemed the OLC is. I mean, in other words, those kind of nationalistic institutional arguments won't necessarily sell right. overseas, nor are they binding on the rest of the world. Well, if, if I can just counter with that, I mean, what's so interesting to me is that the Germans, and for that matter, the, the Belgians who had universal, they, they always thought of themselves as much more limited in what they could do than the Bush administration imagined, right? Mm -hmm. Or that the power of the ICC, which, you know, the U.S. was involved in all those negotiations, is very hard to bring a case for any American to be brought be before the ICC, even if the U.S. hadn't opted out of everything. So there was this, in fact, this kind of building up of all these in international institutions mm -hmm. in the imagination of the Bush folks as being far more powerful than they were. Mm -hmm. And ironically, that's enabled both the human rights community and the Bush admin administration critics and those institutions mm -hmm. to feel themselves more empowered because, I mean, so I think there's this kind of weird reversal like th that, that part of what the Bush administration's fear of law has done Mm -hmm. is to make this thing more legal and to make law more powerful mm -hmm. in the discussion. It's just a... Yeah. No, and in fact, I, I absolutely agree. I think that's part of the fascinating thing. However, I, I actually, um, again, I've written about this elsewhere. I think that there is a distinct difference between international jurisdiction, of which the ICC is a manifestation, and universal jurisdiction. They are not two terms for the same thing. They're two extremely different things. The ICC, in my opinion, is useless. Universal jurisdiction is the best jurisdiction. So. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, here in Chicago, we've been dealing over the last 20, 30 years with systematic <coughs> torture of black suspects in the station house. And we have recently had some successes in dealing with it. And one thing we've been dealing with is the fact that there is no federal or local statute that covers the prosecution of torture. You can maybe get them for aggravated battery, or you can get them for something you know along those lines. And one thing we've been working with some of the congressmen with is to have an actual statute, a federal statute that deals with official police or, or government within this country torture, as defined by the uh, United Nations. And one of the other things that we're dealing with is the concept of whether there should be a statute of limitations in that statute. Because if you look at torture along the lines of genocide or murder, then there should not be a statute of limitations. In it. And the problem here has been nobody ever prosecuted. So all those crimes of torture are now outside of the statute of limitations. And the only investigations that are going on criminally have to do with perjury, obstruction of justice, and other kind of Al Capone type of prosecutions that you can do with these people that everybody <coughs> particularly in the black community, agree should be prosecuted for these crimes, even though it's many years later. I wonder what you thought uh, and other people thought about the concept of such a, a statute and whether uh, the, the statute of limitations should be more or less waived in a crime of torture, whether it be here in this country or uh, statutes that deal more globally with regard to the prosecution of U.S. Uh, abuse. Well, I'm not an expert on how the um, Convention Against Torture would bear on domestic cases, but I'm assuming that it is federal laws or the absence thereof that affects the treatment of prisoners. I absolutely believe that that's a gr you know it would be a wonderful um, thing to have would be a, you know a federal law prohibiting that kind of behavior at, with no you know with no uh, statute of limitations and. One thing we can say is, you know, this is something that gets patterned in, you know, as a law and society person, laws are made when people perceive a need for those laws. And as tragic and horrible as the, tor you know, Chicago torture case has been, it may very well be, the, you know, a galvanizing moment to produce the kind of law that will, you know, be responsive to something like that in the future. I mean, it is, you know, one can actually look in that sort of dynamic and dial you know, dialectical way. But I, you know, many people who work on U.S. prisoners and prison issues, um, 
were, you know, who've been doing it for a long, long time, were very agitated after, you know, with you know, sort of the, the blow up of what happened, what was occurred as the American torture debate, starting with the Abu Ghraib photos and saying, well, gee, that's not, you know, it's at least as bad, if not that worse, in U.S. prisons, the kind of treatment, et cetera. And I mean, that's not untrue. That's absolutely true. It's just that the laws governing foreign prisoners taken into custody overseas are different and in some ways stronger than the laws or, you know, the kind of regulations governing the treatment of prisoners domestically. Thanks again, Lisa. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's an honor to be here. Thanks. And I want to thank both Scott and Martha for inviting me and for putting on this conference. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to talk about something that no one's talked about, um, which is not torture in the international context, but torture in the domestic context. Um, and Mr. Taylor's question is a great prelude to my talk. My talk is going to be historical and hopefully relatively brief. Um, so what I want to talk about is the, um, is the third degree in American history, um, which roughly spans from 19, 18, the 1890s to the 1930s, although in Chicago it kind of continues to the 1990s. <laughs> uh, much, of that is, much of this and other stuff is discussed in, in a new book I have that just came out a couple weeks ago, Police Interrogation and American Justice uh, by Harvard University Press. Um, so, so I want to talk about the history of the third degree, um, the tactics of the third degree so that we see some of the parallels, um, the decline of the third degree and what replaced it, and talk a little bit about law, um, Flint Taylor's question in particular, the constitutional law, why there isn't statutory law, and, and some of the lessons, if there are lessons in this that, that um, for the war on terror. Um, so let me begin by just um, defining the third degree. Um, the th I, I think these definitions matter, and I think whether something is or is not torture matters, although the third degree, um, which I think is torture, um, doesn't use the word torture in the definition. And I say that because of something Darius, who, who has written about the third degree in his new book, um, said earlier. Um, so the third degree was defined by the Wickersham Commission, the government commission that ultimately exposed it. Uh, in 1931 as the employment of methods which inflict suffering, physical or mental, upon a person to obtain um, information about a crime. So you have both information and crime. Um, and the tactics of the third degree, which I want to discuss in a moment, range from very physical forms of torture and coercion to more psychological forms of coercion, some of which we might not even consider torture. Um, in the book, uh, I describe these in three or four or five, maybe six categories, um, one of which is blatant physical abuse. The categories begin to bleed into one another. There's no master logic to the categories, though I think it's helpful, um, particularly with respect to some of the categories in Darius's book, which came out after my book, or at the same time, I should say, after, after I sent this book to press. Um, and his book, which is three times the size of my book, and a great book, um, is less expensive. Um, <laughs> so the moral of the story is published with Princeton, not Harvard. Um, okay, so, um, so, so throughout, the, um, th throughout my study of the third degree and the historical documents of the third degree, you see lots of blatant physical abuse, beating, punching, kicking. I just did a plug for your book, Darius. Um, <laughs> clubbing. Uh, the, so much of the third degree um, involved what the, the term Darius use in, uses in his book, scarring. Um, the third degree was to some extent an underground and secret practice, but in, in, in some places it wasn't. It was very above ground. Police had a word for people they beat up. Um, hospital cases is what they called them. And journalists who observe the third degree had a vocabulary for what happened to people who went into police stations um, shellacking, massaging, a workout, vocabulary to describe um, beatings that were very physical um, and left people bruised, <coughs> bloodied, um, sometimes taken to court in bruised and bloodied states. Um, and so, so part of the third degree was very visible. It wasn't um, entirely secretive and underground. Um, part of the blatant physical abuse also involved um, 
forms of, of burning or electricity um, or, or other ways of um, maligning the body uh, and leaving visible marks. Um, there were police detectives in New York um, who, who bragged about using baseball bats and, and splattering blood on the wall or um, beating up hundreds of criminals with fists, blackjack, and hose. And I'm talking about newspaper articles that they wrote and books that they published at the time. So this is not like some sociologist happened to talk to them for a dissertation. Um, the, the blatant forms of physical abuse were in the minority uh, overall, at least that's, that's the perception one gets from reading the historical records. The emblem or symbol of the third degree is the rubber hose, which we're all familiar with. Um, in American culture, the rubber hose really took multiple forms, and so the Wickersham Commission describes garden hoses, pieces of tires, blackjack soaked in water, and my favorite, um, sausage-shaped sandbags lined with silk, um, to beat people in ways pri primarily below the head that didn't leave marks but yet were excruciating. Oh, and I left one out, that's Chicago Telephone Book, which even at the time was quite, quite big. Um, and of course, there were other ways of administering pain that uh, didn't rely on beating but, but still um, were quite uh, excruciating um, and were more, <coughs> perhaps were deniable. Um, and, and certain areas of the body that were strategically selected in order to administer pain that was deniable. Um, now, now in, in the book, I talk about simple and orchestrated forms of abuse, and there were more complicated forms of abuse um, using electricity and some of the things that we've heard, you know, the water cure form of waterboarding that, of course, um, predates the, 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 the third degree in American history, um, uses of heat, um, more sophisticated methods of, of applying torture, and then there was the psychological component of the third degree, incommunicado questioning, losing suspects, the grilling and exhausti exhaustive questioning and the blinding strobe lights and the force standing, um, early versions of sensory deprivation, at least in America. So, so lots of parallels to what, what goes on um, today in the international context. And of course, as we move from the physical to psychological uh, end of the spectrum, um, forms of deprivation and threats and promises, including extreme threats, um, mock executions, um, threats of mob violence, which were very real in the South, of course, uh, and other forms of threats that are ultimately threats of harm. So, so this is the range of the third degree, um, but there's a great documentary record from very physical to very psychological forms of um, torture, coercion, um, fear, um, manipulation um, that that raise some very interesting parallels that aren't often drawn to what is going on today um, uh, internationally. Now, the part of the interesting story of the third degree is what happened, but um, perhaps the most interesting part of the third degree is, is its decline. How is it that this very entrenched practice, which was s systemic, systematic, widespread, um, there were places where it was far worse, like Chicago, <laughs> um, than other places, um, like Boston or Cleveland, uh, but it was widespread, it was well known, um, and the heyday of the third degree was the 1910s to the early 1930s, perhaps, maybe the 1920s. And so there's an interesting story about um, the decline of the third degree. Now, Scott gave a fascinating talk about the media. Um, there was a sense today, there was a sense that the third degree was in the air. There were plays about the third degree. There were movies that featured the third degree. Um, the third degree was in detective fiction. Um, the, the, the rallying against the third degree was taken up by organizations in the 1920s, bar associations, grand juries. There was lots of muckraking journalism about the third degree. So there was a sense that this was known, this was in the air, not um, favorably portrayed, but not always unfavorably portrayed. Um, and what ultimately, um, the, the, the story about the decline of the third degree is, is really about, I think, two things. One, the Wickersham Commission, which was a government commission in 1931, George Wickersham, former Attorney General, that um, I think it started actually in 1929, that they went across co the country and, and, and systematically interviewed everybody um, who knew about police interrogation practices in particular cities um, and documented extensively in 1931 <coughs> in their report um, that the third degree in its various physical and psychological forms um, was rampant or, or widespread um, and 
um, more than just documenting the practice of the third degree, they also documented the attitude, the police attitude toward the third degree. Uh, and there had been, as I've referred to earlier, um, many journalistic accounts, including books that were um, muckraking in tone, but very um, descriptive, uh, empirical books of reporters who, who followed police around and had wide access to police, even as they administered the third degree, um, which reported many of the same things that the Wickersham Commission had reported. So the story of the decline of the third degree usually begins with the Wickersham Commission in 1931, <coughs> and then there's a story about um, the constitutional law of criminal procedure, and particularly the 1936 case of Brown v. Mississippi and, and its assumed impact on the regulation of police interrogation practices. Um, I want to say that um, the story, I think, is a little bit more complex than that, but the, um, the police reaction to the third degree um, was negative um, and pronounced immediately. The, uh, the Wickersham Commission report was denounced as uh, the greatest blow to police work in the last half century. Um, at the 1932 uh, meetings of the uh, International Association of the Chiefs of Police, which sort of reminds me, uh, as I was looking over my notes, Professor uh, Paul Cassell um, of the University of Utah, then became federal judge, is now his professor again, once said the, sa the very same thing on 60 Minutes about um, Miranda v. Arizona. Um, the police were, were angry in the main, and um, Zachariah Chaffee, who was one of the authors of the um, Wickersham Report, uh, wrote that the Wickersham Report was greeted by the police with two answers which they regarded as conclusive. First, there wasn't any third degree, and second, they couldn't do their work without it. <laughs> um, and Emmanuel Levine, who was, a, who was a reporter for the New York Times, or the New York Daily News, who had um, been one of the privileged reporters to watch police um, administer the third degree in practice, I said privilege in the sense of having access to interrogation rooms um, where awful things happened, and where he ultimately wrote that the third degree is quite um, banal and ordinary in New York City at the time. In 1930, one year before the um, release of the Wickersham Report, wrote that this is the police point of view referring to the third degree. It is a necessary evil, um, but the police must not be caught in administering it. Okay, so, um, so the real story, I think, about the decline of the third degree um, is that um, in the 1920s, there was a group of progressive police leaders um, who were opposed to the third degree and who were trying to professionalize policing. And when the Wickersham Commission report came down, this, this, this created such a splash and so, so much negative publicity that the, the progressive police reformers and other progressives in the legal community, progressive elites, sort of came together. Um, and the third degree quickly became uh, perceived as uh, quite a bad practice, both internally and externally to policing. Um, the FBI was opposed to the third degree. J. Edgar Hoover uh, emphasized scientific forms of policing, laboratory, fingerprints. Um, and there was also a PR aspect to it, that, that um, <coughs> professionalization of policing meant that they had to change their image. They had to be seen as the good guys. People sometimes died in custody in the third degree. They didn't want to be seen as brutes. Um, instead, they wanted to be seen as professional, um, as, as, as professional, um, as fair, as oriented to general norms of legality and uh, due process, and also effective. That, that there was a widespread belief, and the, the Wickersham Commission has evidence for this, and this won't surprise anybody, of course, but the third degree resulted in lots of false confessions and unreliable evidence. And this had all sorts of effects on the criminal justice system. It's not just getting false confessions, but it was also making police lazy, over-relying on confessions, lots of police perjury, poisoning of the stream of evidence. The third degree was used not just on suspects, but also on witnesses to coerce statements. Um, and so the third degree was seen uh, as a problem um, not, only, not only for confessions, but for the criminal justice system as a whole. Um, the third degree declines unevenly but relatively quickly in American history, and so by the 1950s and certainly by the 1960s, um, it appears that the third degree is completely exceptional, um, that the third degree is no longer practiced. Um, uh, although uh, every decade we see, um, we see some example of a scandal um, in modern America in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, um, 
Chicago is the constant, of course, um, with, with many years of, of, of police torture um, in, in Area 2. Um, but there have been scandals in Little Rock, Arkansas, scandals in, um, in LA with the Ramparts case, of course, New Orleans, New York, uh, and elsewhere. So they're sort of episodic um, scandals. Sometimes they may involve a few officers or more than a few officers. But for the most part, the third degree is gone, and, the, and there is a success story um, and perhaps lessons to be learned. Um, the, the, what I argue in the book is that the third degree has been replaced by psych psychological forms of interrogation that sort of rest on twin pillars. Um, again, Chicago is central to the story as it is to every story, it seems, about domestic um, interrogation and confession, including false confession. Um, the rise of behavioral lie detection. Um, on the one hand, the lie detector and the various offshoots of the lie detector and the belief that so-called scientific <coughs> instruments could, could read people's minds and more, more importantly, intimidate people who are being interrogated to think that they could, um, that they could be, um, that their minds could be read and they could be exposed and therefore had no choice but to confess. And then secondly, the interrogation manuals um, by Fred Imbau, notably former professor of North, at Northwestern uh, and um, director of the scientific crime laboratory inside the Chicago Police Department, which seems like a peculiar thing um, in the 1930s. And so you, you get the emphasis on behavioral lie detection, turning police interrogators into lie detectors on the one hand, and these etiquette manuals on psychological manipulation, um, deception, and uh, perhaps even psychological coercion. Um, there's an interesting issue about what exactly is psychological coercion. And I said the second part of the story of the decline of the third degree, I think the first part is the Wickersham Commission and the coming together of reform-oriented police chiefs and police leaders and also progressive, <coughs> excuse me, legal and other elites. The second part of the story traditionally is told in criminal procedure as the famous Brown v. Mississippi um, decision of 1936. Um, Scott said something interesting, I think, about a 1926 Mississippi Supreme Court decision, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, in 1936, the U.S. Supreme Court denounced what I believe was a 1931, although it may have been maybe 1932, 34, um, Mississippi Supreme Court decision where they basically said whipping some African Americans was fine, right? And so, but they repudiated the U.S. Supreme Court in 1936 in Brown uh, v. Mississippi, the use of physical force. And a very clearly unanimous decision um, applied to all the states. And so what you see in the criminal procedure jurisprudence after that, as many people in this room know, um, is, um, is, is circumscribing what police can do psychologically to suspects, um, how long they can interrogate, under what conditions, what sorts of things they can and can't do, culminating in the, in the famous 1966 Miranda case, which, which to some extent has completely displaced the law, um, the constitutional law of voluntariness um, that had initially been about police, or at least psychological, physical and then psychological coercion. Um, so there's an interesting question about, there's a number of interesting questions here that I think are relevant to military and international interrogation issues as well. Um, first of all, um, when, you, when you move from a regime of physical coercion to psychological coercion, um, there are questions of effectiveness, of course, and the widespread belief that the psychological methods are more effective, and that's what drove Fred Inbow and others within the police community to develop um, interrogation manuals. Uh, and they still say that, uh, the, the, the firm that exists in, in their name, Reed and Inbow's name. Um, so, so one issue is, is it more effective and why is it more effective? Um, but another issue is, where is the line between psychological coercion and non-psychological coercion? Or put differently, psychological torture and non-psychological torture. And this raises a host of other, I think, philosophical and normative and legal and policy questions that could be the subject, of course, of another debate. Um, uh, the modern method of psychological interrogation um, is really at its root a two-step process psychologically. It's about convincing somebody that they're trapped, their situation's hopeless, there's no way out, all the evidence is against them, um, resisting is futile. Uh, on the one hand, 
um, breaking down their self-confidence, and on the other hand, giving them motivators or inducements to think that their situation will be better off, to avoid some sort of punishment. It's either now or never. This is your <coughs> only opportunity that if they don't confess or comply, um, what will happen to them is the worst possible situation, but they have this one opportunity right here and now against the backdrop of all the evidence and the futility that's been developed, this one opportunity to improve their situation. Now, that, that's, that's a skeletal um, kind of uh, reduction of a lot of research on the psychology of interrogation. Um, thanks. Uh, I lost my train of thought here. Um, Psychological. Yeah, yeah, psychological interrogation, <laughs> the, the skeleton of psychological interrogation. Um, right, that was the second step, sorry. Um, <laughs> third step. Third step, right, make up a third step. Um, okay. Um, so, so the, um, the question is, um, the one question is, um, is this psychologically coercive, and what do we mean by psychological coercion? And if, if the FBI, I take it, or s some members of the CIA, the, the, the people in, these, in this torture debate who say that we need to not use torture and move to psychological methods, if they ultimately prevail, where do we draw the line? Um, what should be permissible um, in terms of um, psychological methods um, when we move away from, from, from physical methods? Um, the, um, I guess what I wanted to conclude with is what, if any, lessons there may be um, from the domestic history of the third degree, uh, its rise, its decline, um, what's replaced it, um, what the problems were and how those problems were overcome from, um, for uh, what's going on now. Uh, and I haven't given this a great deal of thought, so th this is more in the form of speculations and perhaps recap um, as conclusion to the talk. Um, I mentioned earlier that the Wickersham Commission report um, not only was a study of the practices of the third degree, but also about police attitudes. And one thing that is strewn throughout the Wickersham report are interviews and quotes by police who describe a war mentality, and it's their words, that this is a war on crime and we've got to win this war. And I think that's one of the features that you see in regimes that torture um, domestically, obviously, as well as internationally. Um, and so there's, there's an ideology, an ideological parallel there. And one of the success stories of overcoming the third degree is transforming police I ideology away from that metaphor. Um, there's, there's, and Darius mentions this in his book, um, there's obviously the, the, um, the problem of coercion being corrosive in that it has effects that, uh, that undermine police investigation or any um, investigation. Uh, and so, so one of the lessons of the third degree, I think, or, um, I'm sorry, one of the lessons of the third degree, one of the lessons of the decline of the third degree is that um, it's not just about um, the immediate situation of, of torture. There, there, there are more problems beyond, um, beyond the act of torture. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's obviously about contamination of evidence and corrosion of values and of function. Um, I, you know, I could speculate about a few other um, ideas, but I think I'm just going to summarize, or conclude rather, and then open it up to questions. Um, the, 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 the decline of the third degree um, um, is a remarkable story. It's a success story. It's a coming together of groups that were um, not natural allies. Um, but it also gave rise to its own set of problems. Um, Darius talks about in his book how, um, reg how, how regimes have become sneaky over the years. And um, perhaps the, the, one of the best ways to 
describe the decline of the third degree is, as, a, as I did many years ago in a paper, is as a shift from coercion to deception and ultimately to um, sneaky or deceptive or, as I do in this, in this book, um, a, a fraudulent um, means. And again, that raises a whole set of um, of, of interesting policy and legal and normative issues for discussion. Um, and the point that I, I lost when, um, when I looked at um, the, the sheet that said I had 10 minutes left was that modern police interrogation, and I'll sum up with this point, modern police interrogation in America has really gone from torture, um, the, 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 the third degree, um, um, in both physical and psychological forms to a kind of plea bargaining. What really happens, the logic of modern interrogation today is really plea bargaining without attorneys. Um, I think it's more effective. It's not perfect. Um, there are interesting parallels and perhaps lessons for what's going on today. Thanks. Yeah, I'm very curious um, about in your analysis, if, if race comes up, I'm thinking in particular of, you're talking about the 1920s, 1930s, I'm thinking about the inclusion of, for instance, the Irish and the Italian into the police force. Um, and there is, would be a tie in, I think, with the sort of uh, war and terror and torture in terms of uh, Muslim Americans being incorporated into America. Um, I'm wondering if that is there in the analysis of um, well, the, the historical records that I reviewed when I was um, studying this and writing about it, um, of course, the, the South is famous for the third degree. Uh, but one of the points that's made over and over again is that the third degree occurred in the North and, and all across the country. It was widespread, not limited to, um, but perhaps disproportionately applied to um, African Americans. Um, uh, there was a stronger sense of ethnic identity in many of the police departments, police forces all across the country, and so that comes through. But I'm not aware of any good analysis of race in the, um, in the decline of the third degree, and, and, and most of the focus would be on African Americans in the South, and certain techniques that were, um, were, were terror techniques um, for African Americans like lynch mobs or threats of lynch mobs. But I don't think there's a good racial history of the third degree from either side, police or suspects. I have a lot of them. Yeah. I'll keep the question short because we have a lot of them. Um, one, uh, can yes. you give a quick theory as to why the third degree was more trouble in some places than others? What was what it comes to that? Two, um, why is the decline of the third degree and the rise of deception and fraud in principle better? And three, what's the difference between say, principles, uh, practices and practices in Europe where it seems like things have perhaps not been quite as harsh? There's certainly now the police system, the prison system there, and the uh, police system is not so well, those are all great questions. Um, the decline of the third degree, I think that was your first question, right? Um, why, why was it different in different places? Oh, why was it different in different places? Um, I think Darius mentions in his book that, uh, I, I never heard this before, and it didn't come to me reading the materials that, uh, on the third degree that he did, that, um, that, that it declined unevenly, and correct me if I'm wrong, Darius, because um, there were internal controls and external controls, and the internal controls were more effective than the external controls, the external controls being the press and, and law um, and muckraking, and the internal controls being somebody inside the institution. Um, so that would be one good theory, or maybe it's more than a theory. Well, Empirically I borne out. In the Irish police in Boston cleaned up their act. <coughs> But I mean, is there more of a theory to it than these guys did it and those guys didn't? Is it because the Irish all were of the No, I mean, I think it really, I mean, it's, it's right. I mean, it's, it really took leadership. It took the leadership of a series of professional policemen in the 30s who were committed to getting the, the real bad guys and not having to spend all their time running around talking to the press. 
Um, the, the second question that you asked is, I think, why is, psycho is psychological coercion or psychological manipulation or psychological fraud worse than... Why, why, is why it, should it be better? Why should it be better? Uh, well, that's a question for a philosopher, right? Um, um, well, presumably it doesn't inflict, it doesn't inflict, um, a, a pun I mean, I'm only begging the question, right? But, but the immediate difference to somebody who is a social scientist, not a philosopher, is that it doesn't involve the infliction of pain and, 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 um, and so it's not cruel and degrading and physically ab abusive. But, but again, we could have a whole conference about the more murky ethics of, of, of deception and fraud, and, and one of the strong arguments in the book is, is that's not such a good thing, and most scholars oppose it um, anyway. Um, the, 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 and there's more pragmatic, says, you could talk about more reliable evidence and um, professional norms uh, are more likely to yield to due process and less likely to have scandals. There's all sorts of reasons one could, act, one, one could use to answer the question. The third, um, staying brief, I, I don't know the answer to comparing this to Europe I, because I don't know enough about European history. Yes. Um, the, it seems to me the definition of, of torture is very narrowly medicalized at the current moment. It creates more pain than the way the definitions go. And yet people who are specialists and actually and survivors looking at so-called torture like some of the methods that have been used that are nationally introduced by the CIA, those effects are the Cold War Center up in Evanston that deals with torture survivors. The so-called torture light where you disorient people and other things does much more long-term damage and very difficult to reverse. Now, is there any way the law can deal with measuring the long-term effects rather than just how it feels like at the moment? You say the law, how the law would deal with measuring the long-term effects. I mean, I, I, I think that would be a question for empirical social science or, or medical science, and then, and then perhaps there, there, there could be some legal response to that. Um, I, I, I'm not an expert in that area, but I think much of the third degree was what's much more temporary in, than what's going on today, and so it, less, it, it presumably didn't leave <coughs> as harmful effects, though I'm sure they were harmful. I would contend uh, that the third degree has not disappeared and that it reappeared and how it came, or reappeared in Chicago was following the Vietnam War, that Burge and people like that came back from Vietnam with those tactics, with that attitude about dehumanization of people who uh, at that point were in the movies, but, and, and then came to Chicago and the black people in Chicago were in that dehumanization mode. And that was why the, 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 the torture for the next 20, 25 years happened here in Chicago. We now are sitting in the Iraq war, and I, I fear that this kind is going to be, and hasn't already, uh, be brought back again. So I think we have to be aware. First, I don't think it, it, it necessarily disappeared before, but even if it has receded, that we have to be aware that those kinds of international and national cross, cross you know, uh, 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 is, may well happen again. The other thing I would mention is, as uh, I actually had Fred Inbaugh at Northwestern, and I went to Northwestern Law School, and I, you know, I deposed these detectives day in and day out about these interrogation techniques. I must have proposed 500 or 1,000 Chicago cops over my career about these various techniques from torture to, to, to other kinds of psychological tactics. And I don't think that you can use the psychological Freddie Inbaugh type of tactics without, it's a carrot and stick. And if you don't really have the stick, you're not going to have any effect with the carrot. So when the Inbaugh technique is to kind of imply those kinds of, that the, the mutt of the mutt and Jeff routine is in the other room, and that's what they often use. And if, if the mutt in the other room really has no history or no, no reputation for doing the kinds of third degree tactics, then the Jeff is not going to be as effective in getting the confession. I, th I think that um, it, it, from the perspective of somebody in Chicago, perspective, particularly from the perspective of somebody who's litigated a lot of these cases and knows them as well as you do, I can understand why you would say the third degree hasn't declined. But if you study the historical record and you see just how widespread and routine the, the, these practices were in the 1920s and 1930s, 
um, and how relatively uncommon they are today, especially outside of Chicago. I think there's no, there's no denying that, that something substantially different has happened. Your second point, though, is well taken, and I think Darius mentioned it earlier, that, that there's going to be a cross-contamination, I guess predictively or in terms of hypothesis, when these veterans come back, they may be doing in the future what Burge did, those who become police officers. I think your third point goes really to the psychology of interrogation and, and perhaps speaks to some is issues about what exactly is coercive, is psychologically coercive, and is it inherently coercive? So this is kind of an I think your second question is great. And when I first started studying this many years ago, I sort of I, I, I wondered, um, particularly because because of the, the the social theory of Norbert Elias and the, decline, the civilization of society, decline of um, certain norms of violence, whether there was a unitary phenomenon. But I, I kind of abandoned that early on because I really wanted to get to know my topic. So I, I, the second question, um, I just don't know. I think that'd be a great historical study. The first topic I know well, um, um, as does do most criminal procedure professors, I think. Um, so Miranda is a game that police have to get around, and the courts have made it very easy um, for police to get around. And the way they do that, in part, is by um, defining the interrogation as non-custodial, telling the suspect they're free to leave, um, and then not having to give Miranda warnings, or not giving Miranda waivers, since the Supreme Court says if you don't say anything, the, the, 
the interrogator, if they don't say, do you understand these rights or having these rights in mind, do you wish to talk, but they just launch into the interrogation, the suspect is constructively waived. Now, if there's some ambivalence, then they might do what you said, which is suggest that, well, you know, I can't get your side of the story, or I can't help you, or do you want to hear what I have to say? And this is very common. And the empirical studies that have, have, have documented this show that 90, 95% people waive their Miranda rights. So when I was talking about the, the, the plea bargaining without defense attorneys or the, the two steps of psychological interrogation, um, uh, what I was talking about was post-Miranda interrogation. Miranda usually is meaningless in terms of stopping the, the, what, what's about to occur. It might slow it down momentarily, but it's largely irrelevant. There may be a tactic, but they don't talk about it in their manuals. Thanks again, Mr. The topic of my um, presentation today uh, is in many ways about what is the American practice of rounding up detainees and subjecting them to torture and or cruel and human degrading treatment doing not just to the U.S. but to the rest of the world. And in particular, it's probably appropriate that I come last on the program because one alternative title for my talk could be After Torture. <laughs> which is to say we've all sort of figured out over the last couple of days that at least the public rationale for torture um, is that governments that do it, in the U.S. in particular after 9-11, are looking for information. And what I want to ask is the question, so what do they do with this information? Um, and does that in some ways feed back into the practice of torture to encourage it? Um, and so it turns out, of course, that in most legal systems, um, coerced confessions, at least confessions that you know were coerced, um, have been banished. Um, but nonetheless, that, doesn't, that only begins to talk about what happens to coercive interrogations in court and elsewhere. Now, of course, the rationale um, for interrogational torture in the war on terror is precisely that it won't be used against concrete suspects. The idea is this is intelligence gathering. It's not evidence gathering. And so there's this highly unstable line between intelligence and evidence um, that I think the, the justification of the practice of interrogational torture has been dependent on. And what I want to call into question today is the stability of that line between the two. Now, if you look at all of these folks that the U.S. has uh, rounded up and held in U.S. custody, what's quite striking about this, um, first of all, is that, um, and this is, I think, where it feeds into what Lisa was saying earlier, um, that part of the worry about lawfare was the worry that these detainees, that the question was, what do you do with these detainees? And so there was, from the beginning, a sense that you couldn't trust ordinary courts to actually understand uh, what these kind of exigent situations required. And so, of course, the constitution of military commissions, insofar as they, we know what they are, um, was meant to be, at least in the U.S. context, what you did with the folks who came through this process, that you would sort of send them out to the separate court system, where in many ways the distinction between evidence gathered for intelligence purposes or information gathered for intelligence purposes and information gathered for intelligence purposes could be blurred. This was at least the U.S. view. Um, but if you look at what's happened in the rest of the world, it's actually quite fascinating because even though the U.S. has now released a lot of detainees in its own custody, particularly you know, tens of thousands in Iraq, but even several hundred from Guantanamo, I know of no other countries that have put those detainees on trial. And a lot of it is because on the basis of what evidence would you put these folks on trial? Now, many of them have been put into preventive detention or they've been disappeared in their own countries or things of that kind, depending on the countries that people are sent back to. But once the U.S. rounds up and detains people and subjects them to these uh, interrogation regimes, it becomes very difficult to process them through the ordinary courts. So what I want to focus on instead, because we don't have a lot of information about what happens to those folks, um, is what happens to Others who were not detained, how, what, how has this practice of U.S. detention and forced interrogation affected trials of people who were not part of that archipelago of detention centers? And here's where I want to argue that the, that the effects have actually been profound. Because if the U.S. indeed has in its custody, as it claims, a lot of the high-level folks involved in al-Qaeda and in other terrorist groups um, around the world, then it turns out every time any other country wants to put somebody on trial that comes from one of these groups, evidence that the U.S. has collected 
becomes something that turns out to be relevant to these cases. And this is what's happening in terrorism trials around the world. It's why I've called my paper, actually, the metastasis of torture, because what I want to argue is that these, this intelligence, this, this information which was gathered for intelligence purposes is now actually coming into ordinary trials in ordinary criminal courts in an astonishing range of places in the world. And so I want to add, in some sense, a fourth slippery slope to the three that Darius told us about this morning. Darius told us, you know, you, you, that states that approve um, torture for a few victims wind up having that range expand. A few techniques, the techniques expand, a few exceptions, the exceptions expand. What I want to say is that there's a, there's a similar slippery slope that we can document that happens when you squeeze detainees for information for one purpose, that the purposes expand also, and the information comes to be used virtually everywhere. Now, how does this work? This happens in two different ways. So one is when somebody is put on trial for a terrorist offense anywhere in the world, and we have one U.S. case and a number of cases elsewhere, um, it turns out that statements made by detainees in U.S. custody are often found to be relevant. And the odd part about this is that almost always it's because, so far at least in the cases that have publicly come to court, so far it's because the defendants say, ah, the U.S. has custody of this person who can tell you I was not part of this plot. And so the defendants ask for this evidence for exculpation, <laughs> which puts courts in a real bind, right? Because on one hand, they don't want to say, oh, that's evidence acquired by torture. It's really unreliable. We can't let you use it if it might help you get out of this. And on the other hand, they also don't particularly <laughs> want to use it. So there's a whole series of cases that fall into that category. And then there's a whole series of other cases um, where um, suspects are not put on formal trial precisely because this evidence that governments have about uh, their potential involvement. Um, the reason why the, the Massawi case wound up going in well, to sort of through normal judicial channels was because he was arrested before 9-11. The Bush administration decided very quickly after 9-11 that they were really not going to put any of these cases, or actually by about December of 2001, they had decided that none of these cases were going to go through the ordinary courts. But the Massawi case stayed there. And what happened? Well, Massawi was charged originally with being one of the co-plotters and co-conspirators in 9-11 because he was supposed to be the 20th hijacker. He was also charged with being a member of al-Qaeda and so forth. As the government b began to learn that, in fact, it probably wasn't him, they kept the conspiracy to not for 9-11 charge, but the facts underwriting that charge changed. And so the facts that Massawi was put on trial for, or the allegation, was that his part in the plot was after he was captured to hide information from U.S. government officials so that they wouldn't uncover the plot, and this demonstrated that he was part of the 9-11 plot. Okay, and that was actually what he was convicted uh, for. Now, Massawi's lawyers asked for statements from high-level uh, al-Qaeda um, detainees, in particular from Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, or KSM, as he's called in intelligence parlance, who had <clears throat> claimed on uh, international TV and has claimed now in his own confessions to have been the mastermind behind 9-11. Um, KSM was captured in Rawalwindi, Rawalwindi, Pakistan in 2003, had been held in U.S. custody. We now know that he was one of the three de detainees subjected to waterboarding and presumably a number of other um, harsh techniques. Um, there were some others that Massawi asked for, and I'll explain it a little bit later who they were, but primarily it was KSM. And, and even at that time, pretty, people were pretty certain that KSM had been subjected to techniques that were clearly under any definition torture. So Judge Leonie Brinkema, who really, I think, did an incredible job um, on this trial, despite the fact that she was being insulted and harassed from all sides, um, found that this was clearly relevant to potentially exculpatory evidence. If the mastermind of the 9-11 attack would say that Massawi wasn't part of the plot, there was no way you could say that wasn't relevant to Massawi's defense. And so at first she ordered the government to allow, um, to provide access to KSM on the part of Massawi, the defense team, and that the idea was to do a kind of deposition, a videotape deposition, um, through a remote video feed where KSM could be held in some remote location that was still unidentified, but where both Massawi and his lawyers, as well as the prosecution team, would have access to an ordinary um, uh, examination and cross-examination. The government, of course, refused to provide access to Khalid Sheikh Mohammed or to any of the other detainees that Massawi had asked for, and so Judge Brinkema, I think, did the only thing that she could do 
which was to drop the charges for which that would have been exculpatory evidence, which were all the 9-11 related charges, Moussaoui still could have put a, been put away for a very long time on the basis of his membership in Al-Qaeda, which he publicly confessed to in open court whenever given the opportunity to do so. In fact, Brinkema kept telling him, don't say that now. You can wait till later if you really want to do it. Um, so it was clear you could have gotten a fairly long prison sentence. The government, however, wanted the death penalty. They wanted to preserve the charges, so they appealed her um, her dropping of these charges to the Fourth Circuit. And the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals issued what I think is truly a remarkable judgment, uh, remarkable not only for what it says, but also for the fact that so few legal scholars have taken note of it. Um, essentially what the Fourth Circuit says was, yes, that's the usual remedy if the government's refusing to provide exculpatory information to the defense. The usual remedy is that the charges have to be dropped. But the Fourth Circuit says, this case is too serious to drop the charges. <laughs> which is to say they already have the feeling they know what the evidence looks like before the evidence has been presented. Um, and they said the government has decided for national security reasons that they can't provide access to KSM and the other uh, detainees, uh, and we have to take their word that that's true. Okay, so they said, but it is also the case that Masawi can't get a fair trial unless he has access to this information the good news. So they said, let's try to craft a substitute for an actual examination and cross-examination. And what we'll do is we'll have the government uh, turn over, um, and calling them redacted summaries is um, only begins to describe it. Um, <laughs> what the government was willing to turn over um, were things that look like stipulations. If you've ever done evidentiary production, you know, if this person were to show up, he would say that and then a bullet point list of points. There are no quotations in this. They've been, this list has been compiled by the government, which is, of course, not a neutral party in this case. Um, there is no discussion about under what circumstances were these statements produced, or over how long, or un under what kind of interrogative conditions were these statements produced. The Fourth Circuit looked at these things and said, the judge can work out how to get a further summarized further redacted version to show to the jury of this, and that the thing that would preserve um, the truthfulness um, of this, or the thing that would preserve the integrity of these statements, was that the defense could work with the prosecution to craft which elements of these statements came in. Now, they weren't just allowing the defense to bring in the exculpatory bits. The idea was if this was a witness, then the prosecution would be allowed a cross-examination. So the idea was that the prosecution could also introduce, under the rule of completeness, for those of you evidence buffs, under the rule of completeness, could also introduce other aspects of the redacted summaries that would tend to balance out the stuff that the uh, defense was trying to bring in. Um, now, think about this for a second. This is all happening in an opinion that never mentions the most crucial word they might have said, which is hearsay. Um, now, the hearsay doctrine is much maligned. It's really complicated. It takes a full half semester to teach for all those of us who have taught evidence law many times. It's way too complicated. It looks like we ought to just junk it because it's too hard to understand and explain. Nonetheless, the hearsay rule is the main rule that actually prevents evidence acquired by torture from coming into common law jurisdiction cases. And how does it do it? It requires the live production of witnesses so that the jury and the fact finders can see somebody and whether they seem to be testifying under their own steam or under coercion, right? That's why you want the actual production of witnesses. As soon as you go to written records, especially written records produced by the government, you have absolutely no guarantee against the kinds of things that the hearsay rule is supposed to protect you from. And so it's remarkable in this Fourth Circuit decision that they never once mentioned the hearsay rule. While they are functionally carving out what I'm calling a national security exception to the hearsay doctrine. Okay. So what do they do? They actually say, and this is the more stunning thing, because you might say, those of us who've been, everyone in this room, wants to scream, what about torture? Or at the very least, coercion, especially with someone like KSM, whom we know has been waterboarded and it was known at the time the Fourth Circuit decision came down. Here's a quote from the Fourth Circuit decision. Nothing in the government's submissions in connection with the petition contradicts our conclusions that those redacted the witnesses, I think it's who, who interrogated, judging from this, those who re interrogated the witnesses have a profound interest in obtaining truthful information. To the contrary, we are even more persuaded that the redacted process, 
interrogation process, is carefully designed to elicit truthful and accurate information from the witnesses. The Fourth Circuit goes on. We emphasize that we have never held, nor do we now hold, that the witnesses' statements are in fact truthful and the jury should be so instructed. Instead, the jury should be informed that the circumstances were designed to elicit truthful statements from the witnesses. <laughs> Okay, so what happens is that the case goes back to the trial judge. She crafts these statements. I actually have them. It turns out that it was not just um, KSM, but also al Hasawi, um, al Qatani, who's now the 20th hijacker. Al Qatani is the guy who was dressed in a diaper and flown around for 30 hours, being told he was taken to Egypt. He gets back off at Guantanamo. They interrogate him, pretending to be Egyptians. Um, so his interrogation is also known to be, shall we say, somewhat compromised. Um, Halad and Hambali, who are, again, two very high-level detainees, it would be surprising if they weren't subjected to the most harsh interrogation protocols that the CIA had. From all five of these detainees, 128 pages of summarized redactions come into the Massawi case. Um, and these summarized redactions turn out to have a few paragraphs that say, Oh, yes, I plan KSM says, I planned all of 9-11, and we gave up on Massawi because he was too unreliable, but we planned to use him for a second attack. There's about six paragraphs that, of exculpatory evidence and about 20 pages of the plans for the second attack that Massawi was allegedly involved in. Um, when uh, Hambali testifies, he says, well, you know, Massawi wasn't involved because he was unreliable and unbearable, but this is, a, this is a quote from the summary, which is to say it may not be a quote from Hambali. But Massawi had dreams of flying a plane into the White House. Okay, now all of this is coming in, I have to just emphasize, as a written document over any hearsay objection, because remember the defense asked for this. Um, that's why there's sort of no objection flying around in the courtroom, and at least as much of it is as inculpatory as exculpatory. In fact, when the conviction of Massawi came down, even though it's really hard to, to claim that his participation in the 9-11 plot was very serious, I think from having looked at the record that the stuff that tied him most in to Al-Qaeda and some kind of plot was this allegedly exculpatory information. This is now an appeal to the Fourth Circuit, um, but nobody's raising the torture point because the defense wanted it, they're not going to say it, and the prosecution is certainly not going to say, well, we tortured these guys so you can't use the evidence, so it doesn't come up. A very similar case uh, came up in Germany, um, the Mutasadik case, um, and there was another one that was dropped, but there were two guys left over from the Hamburg cell that had plotted 9-11 that were put on trial by the German government for being accessories to planning 9-11. And here, the very same thing happened. Um, there was one case that got dropped because the exculpatory evidence that the German government had, because they had all of these intelligence summaries was withheld from the defense, and in one case, the case collapsed. But in the, in the Mutasadik case, um, the exculpatory information was revealed by the time the case went up on appeal. This was a guy convicted of being part of the 9-11 plot. The appeals court um, voided the conviction and said they had to go back and do it over again, adding the exculpatory information that came from, again, high-level detainees. In this case, it was Ramzi bin al Sheib and, again, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, and high-level detainees subjected to the worst of the worst uh, CIA tactics. Now, the German law, I won't go into it at great length. If you want to know, I can tell you all about it. German law is, in fact, more restrictive about admitting coercive statements. And it applies not only to coerced confessions, but coerced third-party statements and a whole variety of things. Um, it turns out that, of course, they were also troubled by the fact that this evidence had clearly come from, from compromised interrogations. So what did the court say? Well. Uh, here's a quotation from the appeals court that looked at the introduction of these summarized redactions, the same kind of evidence that came in in Massawi. <clears throat> the fact is not ignored here. This is translation of the um, appeals court decision. The fact is not ignored here that it is state agents of the United States, a country accused in the press of torture, who deny the division access to sources from which might be expected comparatively more reliable and in particular verifiable information uh, than that available in press articles and reports of humanitarian organizations, which is to say, lots of people say the U.S. tortures, they're not helping us in figuring this out. Um, however, a significant circumstance added to the inadequate evidence situation in this case is the fact that the forwarded summaries of the examinations of bin al Sheib, Sheikh Mohammed, and a guy called Ul Slahi do not exhibit the one sidedness of a universal incrimination of persons not in custody. 
which might be expected if torture had been used to extract information incriminating only certain suspects. In other words, and the opinion goes on, because the redacted summaries had some information for, some information against, it was a kind of on the one hand, on the other hand kind of information, they said, that can't have been produced by torture because that's not what evidence produced under torture looks like. <laughs> So therefore, the German court was fine taking this into account because that kind of evidence could not have been produced by torture. And they've upheld the conviction. <clears throat> and now this guy is going to prison. So again, this is, these are two systems that pride themselves on not using uh, torture, uh, tortured evidence. Let me give you one last example. And this is um, from the UK, where the British government was using, again, the same soup of evidence acquired by by the very least uh, active coercion, um, to detain suspects in a regime of preventive detention. Um, and so there's now a system uh, where the Home Secretary issues something like a security certificate. They can detain suspected terrorists, um, actually, as it turns out, more or less indefinitely, upon, quote, reasonable suspicion of the Home Secretary that a specific person is a terrorist. Now, there's judicial review of this reasonable suspicion standard, and there's a court called the Special Immigration, Special Immigration Appeals Court, or SIAC, which reviews these determinations. So at least in Britain, there's some built-in judicial review. And SIAC is supposed to review the evidence on which the Home Secretary based the decision to detain to determine whether that detention is reasonable. Now, the Home Secretary, uh, this is back in 2004, made some public statements that some of the people currently under detention might have been kept on the basis of evidence acquired by torture. And the Home Secretary asserted, we have the right to put people under detention, even if the evidence on which they're detained was acquired by torture. We have an obligation to protect our citizens. So the case went up eventually to the law lords on the question of whether this SIAC, the special court, could use evidence potentially acquired by torture as part of the case that would determine whether the Home Secretary's judgment was reasonable. And so the law lords had to rule on whether tortured evidence was ever possibly used in any court in Britain. So even though this came up in a special court, the judgment is actually more broadly constrained. And many of you have heard about this judgment because the headline the day the law lords announced the judgment was, law lords ban torture. <laughs> and, and in fact, the, the quotations are great. Lord Nichols of Bir Birkenhead says, torture is not acceptable. This is a bedrock moral principle in this country. Lord Hoffman says, all seriatim opinions. Lord Hoffman says, the use of torture is dishonorable. It corrupts and degrades the state which uses it and the legal system which accepts it. Lord Hope of Craighead says, the law will not lend its support to the use of torture for any purpose whatsoever. Lord Roger of Earls Ferry says, the history of the matter shows that torture has been rejected by the English common law for many centuries. Anyway, you can, every single judge comes out with some statement like that. Lord Brown of Eaton under Haywood says, torture is an unqualified evil. It can never be justified. OK, so let's look at what they actually say. They say, no British court can ever use torture in, as, as evidence sustaining any judgment at all. However, there are a number of qualifications. So one is, um, in order for a statement to be disqualified as having been acquired by torture, you have to show on the basis of a balance of probabilities that that particular statement was acquired by torture. Moreover, the, um, the judgment completely rules out using either press accounts or human rights reports at showing that a particular state has a habit of using torture. <clears throat> and so from the way they say it, depending on which judgment you look at, it's at least conceivable that, for example, if you could show that a statement by Khalid Sheikh Mohammed had been made in some session other than the one in which he was waterboarded, it was probably OK. Um, and so, but again, who would know? Exactly. So one of the problems we have here is that because, as we've discovered over two days, torture is always practiced in secret, it's going to be nearly impossible for any court to ever determine that any particular state was that any particular statement was acquired by torture, and so the lovely rhetoric turns out to be mostly useless at actually giving any particular lawyer the basis for excluding a statement acquired by torture. Moreover, and this is something we really haven't mentioned much over the over our conference, of course, in international human rights agreements, torture is usually paired with cruel and human and degrading treatment, which is equally banned. The US um, incorporation of that in domestic law tries to split the two apart. There's a lot of hair splitting between these two categories. Uh, and in Britain, there was a question about whether cruel and human and degrading treatment, um, evidence acquired through CID treatment, was also banned. 
The law lords in this opinion say, and by the way, our opinion applies only to evidence acquired by torture, not evidence acquired through cruel and human and degrading treatment, and they don't define the difference. Third, they say, so this is not a good decision I'm trying to get you to see here. The third thing is that they say, and moreover, because of separation of powers concerns, our decision only applies to courts. So courts may not use evidence acquired by torture, though they can use CID treatment evidence, but the executive can use any evidence acquired by torture because we can't tell the executive what evidence that the executive can use. And all, all seven of these judges who said these great things also said it was fine for the executive to use information acquired by torture. Um, and then finally they said, and then there's this question of derivative evidence. Derivative evidence is where somebody says, you know, there's ricin buried in my backyard and then the police go and find the ricin. Can you introduce the ricin, right? The fruit of the poisonous tree stuff. Now, Britain in general doesn't have a doctrine of fruit of the poisonous tree, but in this context where evidence was ex explicitly acquired by torture, and this is what the court is ruling on, they said any derivative evidence is perfectly okay to use. Okay, so this is the law lords ban torture decision. Um, and so <laughs> what I hope to show you is this is just a couple of examples. There are other examples from Spain. Now Russia's got a couple cases coming up that as other, other jurisdictions attempt to detain and prosecute terrorists, even though they're committed to using their own ordinary judicial processes, the fact that the US has done this is now spreading through other countries' legal systems, both in the sense that decisions now have to be made about how far torture is allowed in a context where the assumption was it was never allowed, but now courts have to make these, distinct, these sort of distinctions between cruel and human and degrading treatment, torture, derivative evidence, all these things are now the object of judicial doctrine. And moreover, because of the fact that everybody recognizes that you can't do any of these prosecutions, even in a system that has not violated these rules, without, in some sense, getting this evidence swept into it, courts are using this extraordinary situation of the war on terror and the U.S.'s use of torture to make exceptions in their own system which go beyond just the use of torture in that case. And so that's why I called my presentation the metastasis of torture. The, after, the, after the U.S. torture, even if U.S. torture were to stop now, it's still having this effect in legal systems around the world. And this becomes, I hope for anyone in the room, inclined to do a cost-benefit analysis. This becomes one more reason not to do it. Thank you. so much that, I mean, I like the idea of the fetishization of paper. I'm not sure that's it. I think what happens here is that the only way that information could be used is if it's sanitized, right? So that you have to detach the information from the practice of torture. And that, the, and that getting it all in these redacted summaries, which again, don't use quotes, because there's also translation issues in the middle of all this stuff, which nobody's really talked about yet. You know, is, did jihad mean that he was worried about it or was he was going to attack the U.S.? I mean, just to, just to take one thing. Um, so so there's, tra there's a whole bunch of issues about the, about the movement of whatever has been said in the torture context 
to paper, right? And once it's on paper, it becomes possible for everyone to ignore how it was produced. And that, I think, becomes one of the incentives to torture, right? Is, that, is the production of the paper, not for paper's sake, but precisely to, to make it not a, co not a physical practice. The paper looks voluntary. Right? And as, as this German judge says, you can put in all this, like on the one hand, on the other hand, stuff, you know, that, I mean, because I'm sure when people um, are tortured, they say contradictory things, and that becomes ironically a marker of the truth of it. So I, so I think paper is an artifact of the separation of the practice from the information. I had a question about um, whether, uh, you know, a lot of the people that we're talking about um, have been, were arrested you know, in a sense, a while ago. I'm just wondering if now, with all the, uh, you know, sort of at least from the Bush administration or perhaps the British administration's um, views as well, the liabilities of Guantanamo now far outweigh the benefits. Right. Ellen, you know, but so what about all the people that are being arrested now and are and their identities are, in a sense, not known? And presumably, a future Khalid Sheikh Mohammed will never even be known. In a sense, is that is there anybody who's being held? overseas now yeah. whose information is available? Or is that stuff actually just completely precluded from even ever making it to courts? Oh, goodness. Well, I mean, the first thing is I, you know, I have to say that I'm on record as one of the people who really doesn't want Guantanamo to be closed. Oh, indeed. Um, right, <laughs> because that's one of the few places where we might get legal supervision of this process. And if you ship them all to Bagram, you're never going to get it, right? So, so I actually think that it would be better if everyone went to, was sent to Guantanamo. Or if Guantanamo is closed, that everybody be moved to the U.S. But that would be the only circumstance under which I would advocate closing Guantanamo. So one of the things the Bush administration has obviously tried to do, um, and actually a friend of mine who works at the CIA was saying, I mean, probably he shouldn't have been saying this to me at the time he said it, but when they were rounding up all these people and he said, you wouldn't be, you would be surprised what we've been permitted to do, and then the day the torture memo leaked, he called me up and said, you see? I said, <laughs> I said, I actually said, if you've been relying on this as a legal argument, you should, you know, stop it. And then he sends me an email the next day saying, read the Washington Post, and the headline in the Washington Post was, all these uh, harsh techniques had been canceled. So, I mean, so they really thought that was a legal excuse. But anyway, so one of the problems that the CIA recognized from the very beginning was that there was no end game for this, right? You round up these people, you squeeze them, and then what? Right, so they were pressuring the Bush administration to have some trial process that would allow these folks, I mean, because in many cases, these really are people who should not be let go, right? And so the question is, through what, what process would ever legitimately produce a conviction that would allow them to be held on regularized grounds? And that's what I think the military commissions are moving toward. But because there's been this, you know, what you see, actually, and I, I must say that, you know, as an evidence teacher and a concurrent pro teacher, you say this to your students, this is the best example of it. The individual rules may look really funny, but the stuff works as an integrated system, actually. And when you start, when you pull one thread out and you, you make a whole series of exceptions along one line, it affects everything else. So, so using coercion in this one spot means you, you contaminate all the possible trial processes. Right? And so I think what will eventually wind up happening is that there'll be some kind of military commission that will probably have to be forced not to use coerced confessions. Um, whether they use coerced third-party third statements is where I think where all the action is. Um, but yes, there are still people, um, there are now new sites, I think we're all pretty confident about this, that there are new sites that new people have been detained in and have been put elsewhere. The Bush administration appeared to clear the deck so that all the investigative journalists would go away and they dump the worst of the worst into Guantanamo. But there are clearly new sites and there are new people being detained. And I think they're trying to work out, I mean, they've clearly realized that they have to keep them secret, keep the site secret, and probably disappear them at the end of it all. It's the pump and dump, you know, back to that again. Um, could you speak a little bit about the kind of reverse uh, uh, idea, which is which there was a big trial here in Chicago recently of a Palestinian activist. And they conduct, because he was originally tortured for 80 days in Israel, uh, the confession was not held to the same standards as it would be if there were a confession taken by the U.S. agents. So we had this secret motion to suppress where unnamed Israeli agents came to this country and, and the judge then listened to them in secret and we couldn't hear <coughs> what their testimony was, on and on and on. But the point is, with that kind of confession or a rendition type of statement or one taken by an Egyptian uh, torturer, you have the same kind of effect as what you're talking about. 
Yeah, this is actually, I mean, a, a hot topic for American constitutional criminal procedure. The globalization of criminal procedure has not yet happened. And in fact, U.S. courts have really struggled with this question of how much of the Constitution applies extraterritorially. Um, I always want to say extraterrestrially, but, um, <laughs> but, but um, so for example, it's even unclear, um, certainly with confessions in foreign countries, um, it's been very, it's certainly the case that people are not held to Miranda type notice. Um, it's not even clear that confessions off U.S. territory of non-citizens are held to Miranda-type notice, even if it's FBI interrogators doing it. That's to show you how. So there's a lot of cases that are trying to figure out how far does the Fourth Amendment extend, how far does the Fifth Amendment extend um, to uh, the production of evidence abroad. And the courts are totally at sea about this. Um, and so what they tend to do, and the State Department often intervenes in these things and basically says, if you don't believe this, it'll disrupt foreign relations. And there's some undercover motion um, that goes to the court basically saying, believe this or we'll never be able to talk to Israel again and it's too important for us to talk to Israel. So um, it's a really important area. The doctrine on this is not settled. Um, and there have been too few cases that are too different from each other to show a real central tendency on that. But I think you're absolutely right. One of the things I'm very worried about, though, in context of the war on terror, is what I call the, the torture division of labor. Um, there's a case of this guy, Abu Ali, the guy who was uh, convicted of uh, plotting to assassinate President Bush, an American citizen. You may have missed this case. Um, it went by really fast. But this was an American citizen studying um, in an Islamic school in Saudi Arabia. He was arrested out of the library um, in his school and held in the Saudi jail, interrogated by Saudi investigators day and night for a very long time. He apparently um, admitted to not liking President Bush and wishing that President Bush were out of office. Um, in the meantime, in the meantime, his right exactly. In the meantime, his parents, who had some communication with him, learned that he was told by one of his guards that he was being held there because the U.S. wouldn't allow him to be let go. This is an American citizen in Saudi Arabia. So his parents file a habeas case in Washington. And the judge, on the basis of the evidence the parents put forward, say there's enough evidence to believe that, it's, that the guy's being held at U.S. behest in a foreign country. And they started down the road towards scheduling a habeas hearing. And suddenly the guy is airlifted back to the U.S. and charged with attempting to assassinate President Bush. And it's on the basis entirely of things he said in Saudi custody to Saudi interrogators. Okay? He claimed that this was under coercion and torture. Uh, there was a closed hearing about this after which the judge ruled that there was no such coercion. And the only evidence against him were his own statements to the Saudi interrogator. Um, so what I'm concerned about is that the rendition program in these kinds of cases show that one of the ways the US has been trying to handle these cases is to get somebody in jail into a foreign country where the Constitution doesn't apply and where coercion can't be inquired into too closely for various kinds of diplomatic reasons. Then you bring the person back here, you put them on trial, you convict them here, even in the cases of American citizens. So there's a kind of division of labor um, where their country does the torture and we do the convictions in court. So it's a, it's a bigger problem and that there's an increasing number of cases that have that general shape. I know there are many more questions, but unfortunately we're out of time. I, Scott gets the last word, but before that, let's thank him. Um, first thing, very quickly, if you are, are a presenter here and we have not exchanged paperwork yet and you are going to leave this town, you need to exchange paperwork with me near, in the very near future. Second of all, I want to thank all of the speakers because they have been so terrific over the course of these days. Um, and there's a little bit of a story with this. If you had any idea how little I knew about torture, which was even a less than I know now, uh, a couple, three, four, or five months ago, you would not imagine that we would get this pa range of great speakers together for this kind of conference. And uh, so besides having given great talks, I want to also point out some of them, especially like Darius Rajali and uh, Lisa and Kim have given me great feedback as well as uh, others I'm probably going to forget to mention as to who to talk to, who to invite, all these sorts of things. They have been very, very helpful to me because I could not have 
thought of this altogether. But it's also, of course, the case that none of them would have come if just sort of like guy they've never heard of before <laughs> sends an invitation to come to talk at the University of Chicago in the winter. Hmm. And of course, the reason why they came is because it, the stationery says Martha Nussbaum at the top. And at the bottom it says from Martha Nussbaum and Scott Anderson. And the from her. And, it's, and she has been a great guide and friend and mentor and my the efficient cause of this position here uh, existing and the uh, fact that the dean would trust me with budget would like go go spend money bring people here is because uh, she is sort of like the good housekeeping seal of approval on <laughs> academic effect events. If she's behind it, you know that it will be good. People will show up and think that it's fabulous, and in fact, they were right all the way top to bottom. So thank you, Martha, for your support and uh, for, for all of the work that you did with her.